Beckman tonight. Uh, Mr. Bailey is not able to attend. And uh, we do have three different meetings. My suggestion would be what to do what we usually do, which is have the select board meeting first, and then the board of liquor control, and then um, the board of sewer commissioners, which will meet with the prudential board of the fire district. So I'll call the select board to order at seven o'clock and ask for um, a motion regarding the agenda. So moved. Mr. Wyman moves. Second. Second from Tim Giles. Any changes to the agenda? I have one. If we could omit number eight, which is the executive session, we'll wait until we have a full board for that one. So cross out number eight. Any additions to the agenda? Um, I wanted to suggest we talk about S-344 just um, as a board discussion. And when would you like to do that, Tim? Um, um, maybe after 5, 5.5, something like that. Okay. So after number 5, insert an item to discuss Senate yeah. or S-5, what is it, 344? S-344, yes. S-344, which uh, Representative Jerome sent to us today. It was passed by the legislature, but hasn't been signed by the governor yet, is my understanding from Right, that's what I understand as well. Anything else to change? If not, all in favor, uh, so we'll do what we have been doing. We will call a roll if there's a not unanimous vote, but if there's a unanimous vote, we won't call a roll. So all in favor of the agenda as it's been amended, say aye. 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 Is that unanimous, Dave, in your? Yes. It was unanimous. Okay. Item two, approval of the minutes of April 27th. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Weinman and a second by Mr. Coolidge. Are there any errors or omissions in the minutes as they were submitted? None heard. All in favor of the <laughs> approval of the minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. That's unanimous. Item three, the town manager's report. Mr. Raffin. Okay. Uh, this is my report for the weeks of April 27th and May 4th. Uh, segment six, Casella was able to resume work on April 20th. They've been putting down topsoil, adding bark mulch, and started plantings. They've been pouring the remaining concrete steps to residential properties, and they started repairing sections of sidewalk where there was spalling. Um, the first section they did was in front of the library. It seems to be holding well, so we're, we're still pushing them. Um, sort of an extended warranty on the sidewalk just so it makes it through the next winter season. Um, line strappers started here this week to prep and paint road markings and parking lot markings. Obviously the rain shut them down today. Uh, Park Street, project started on May 4th. All the asphalt's been pulled up. New sewer line installation should be starting this week. Uh, Union Street sidewalk, all the sidewalk has been poured. Driveway aprons were actually done today. Um, Topsoil is laid down. They just got a little bit of cleanup to do on, on the property, and that'll be done. Um, other happenings: uh, we, w the town was awarded the grant that I applied for to construct the parking area behind the former mobile station. The total award amount is ninety-two thousand dollars, so that will cover some some uh, stormwater uh, mitigation in there. Maybe a rain garden or two on the edge because of that little brook. So. Pretty excited about that. Um, we're still on schedule for a June start on the Churchill Road culvert. Also, we're coordinating with the Forest Service to rebuild the road up to their parking area, and they have offered to share costs on materials if we provide labor, so not a bad deal for us. Uh, rec department news. We have nearly 100 people signed up for community art projects documenting our experiences around the pandemic and staying safe together. Folks will get their canvases and materials donated by Trish Keith by the end of the week. They will share pictures of their masterpieces via social media using the hashtag Brandemic. And we will collect and display their works at the Brandon Library this fall with an auction in February of 21 that will serve as a fundraiser for Brandon Rec Trail development. 
online fishing derby is going on from May 9th to May 16th. Folks will submit pictures of their catches on fans of Brandon Rec Facebook page. And a drawing will be held to give away a fishing package to one lucky mini angler. All families will receive a bumper sticker, too. Uh, with the easing of the gover governor's stay-at-home order, the Brandon Rec is making adjustments, relying groups of up to 10 or fewer that are following the VD. HCDC guidelines around social distancing to use parks and courts. Play structures are still closed. We've had to collect all the picnic tables to encourage folks to adhere to the arrive, play, and leave requirements around this easing of restrictions. For the newest easing as of Friday, May 8th, we are allowed to plan for modified summer camps. How this will impact our potential continued collaboration with Otter Valley is still up in the air. The school has yet to decide if they will have a summer program and the state park has been our host, and Bill says stay tuned, we'll see what happens. Um, I do have something I wanted to add in my report that was brought to my attention later today, that apparently there's some hate mail going around that's being uh, targeted to Republicans, and um, the return address is 49 Center Street, which happens to be the town office. Mm. So um, I have notified Chief Brickell on this, and I will talk to the the post office tomorrow, but it's definitely not from us. So just wanted folks to be aware of it. And uh, if anyone knows anything about it, let Chief Brickell know. That's all I have tonight. Thank you, Mr. Atherton. Are there any questions uh, for the town manager from the board? Mr. Coolidge? Nothing. Mr. Wyman? Nothing. Mr. Giles? No. I have none. Are there questions from the public for the town manager? If you could raise your hand or get my attention otherwise. Anything for the town manager? Hey, Seth, it's Lee. Hi, Lee. Um, Dave, how many pieces of mail are we talking about? Well, I've only heard of a couple so far, mm -hmm. so um, that's all I can tell you right now. I don't know if it's directed towards how many people it's directed towards. So just two, two I know of so far. Okay, thanks. Other questions for the town manager? I don't see anyone else, so we can always have public comment later too. That's fine. So item four is the animal control officer's report. We have Margaret Cars tonight. So Margaret submitted uh, a written report, which on behalf of the board, I thank you for that. It had a lot of detail that the board needed to hear. Um, did you want to have, and I don't need you to read the report or that kind of thing, but did you have any context you wanted to provide or follow up you wanted to instigate? Um, well, I'm fortunately with all of my digging around and trying to piecemeal things together to figure out what we can and cannot do. Um, I've made some contacts and I, as I stated in the letter, I have reached out to uh, the Vermont Humane Federation and I, I've recently just in the past couple of hours got like two or three emails from other animal control officers who serve in a greater capacity than just the local ordinance. Um, and talking with the league, I mean, it's definitely doable. The, the issue is, is that there's just no training right now. And, you know, we have to, in the interim, we got to figure out who's doing what and when. I handled a, a call that came in yesterday. Somebody had, um, some peacocks in their yard. We didn't really mind them in their yard, but they were worried that somebody was missing them. Um, so even though technically speaking, it's out of the scope of what I'm allowed to do. I just went on Facebook, tagged town of Brandon, stated that there were some feathered friends that were visiting neighbors. And if anybody was missing any to, to please notify the animal control officer. Um, and it, it just, so it turned out that some, somebody shared a, a picture of somebody who was saying, but they were missing birds fitting the birds that I heard about. So I just, you know, connected the dots and let the person who had the peacocks know that the people who were missing them were missing them. And voila, problem solved. You know, little things like that, I don't think there's going to be an issue with me taking care of it. But 
when we get into the bigger issues. Um, Margaret? Yes. Um, I read your, um, your letter with great interest, and um, it seems like you're looking for support in getting um, the town ordinances um, updated. So they're current and they're properly um, written. Is that, well, is that? I mean, support is definitely a, a wonderful thing. But from, from what, I'm, what I've learned and the calls that I have received, I think the town is calling for, I don't think that everybody understands exactly what the ordinance says that I can do and what I cannot do. Um, there's a very specific ordinance that was written, I think, in 95. Um, no, I can't remember exactly when. But, you know, it, it, because of the way it's written, like if somebody calls me up and complains that there's anything but a dog or a cat or, or a ferret <laughs> in their yard, like there's really nothing I can do. Like, like the peacocks, there's, there's really nothing that I can do. Um, and then there are things that I, even if I got all the training and had all the, the ability to do what the state says that I can do, there are certain things that I still can't do. Um, like was mentioned in the letter about the dog bites. You know, so now we have this dog in this neighborhood and, and what do we do? Because um, I don't think anybody knew that, that it was you know, the select board by state law is supposed to hold this hearing and then make a decision. And if they, the decision is that the dog bit somebody outside of its yard um, unprovoked, then a protection order needs to be drawn up by the town, by the select board. And the select board has to, I believe it states certified mail um, of what is to be done about the situation to protect the, the neighboring people from whatever animal it is. And, the, you know, and then there's other things that the, the state of Vermont requires that dogs that are running at large be impounded by the animal control officer or pound keeper or enforcement officer. Um, and those are in there at, that I'm allowed to do that. Um, but there's fees and procedures that at one point the town of Brandon adopted into rule, but isn't practiced now. So, you know, do we keep that or do we get rid of it? Um, if, and and the, the fees for impoundment that are in the ordinance, from what I can see, it was something that was allowed by the state. Um, and at one time the town of Brandon thought it was important enough that they adopted like the fullest allowance for fees um so so do i understand you're looking for guidance about um you know what you should and shouldn't be able to do um yes yes dave is this something that you think is a select board responsibility or is this a town manager responsibility to give her guidance you're muted dave <laughs> To lay out what the animal control officer can and can't do? Um, well, it seems that Margaret's asking for guidance and direction. And, um, and I'm wondering if that's something that you do as our town manager or that's something that the select board does because um, it seems that she falls underneath the select boards. Well, the, the select board would have to be the ones responsible for drafting a new ordinance. That wouldn't be, it's not my jurisdiction there. Um, I think we have to be careful on if we're going above and beyond what we're allowed to do statutorily too. Um, and, you know, there has been lots of discussion about what we do with farm animals that are now people's pets. And, you know, maybe the definition of domestic animal needs to change at the state level in order for us to be able to, um, you know, but it has. be done. So, that's, you know, that's the thing. I, I, I hesitate to do something that's outside of the statute, to be honest with you, but that's up to the board. Well, so does it make sense for the board to have some kind of a small working group that would, um, you know, look into these issues and um, make a suggestion for how we could update our policies? I think I sent you guys the VLCT 
model policy a few weeks back. Right. Our current one that's a record. So that I thought was sort of going to be the starting point of. Yeah, I agree. Rewritten. I agree. It, if I might, so it's, it's a bigger issue than just rewriting an ordinance. I mean, I'm not only asking for guidance, but I'm asking for the board members and Dave to, to take some time and sit down at least with a big book of wolf and, and like learn what's in there because it's like, there are, are players that I don't think realize they're players in how the, all of this pans out. Like, you know, there's a dog census that's supposed to happen every year and where we by law have to impound animals and or dogs that are running at large and i i talked with garrett today from for the the league of city and towns and he said that you know it is within the the town's rights to adopt different ordinances and there are ways to change what domestic pet actually means and it's, it's in the big book of Wolf, and he's also going to be forwarding me more information. Um, we talked uh, at length again today. Um, and <clears throat> with the statutes, it, it's really up to the town. If they want an animal control officer who only deals with, like, the ordinance that we have now, which is very limiting, then somebody else has to deal with all those other pieces. And, and from what I'm seeing, there's a disconnect, some miscommunication about who's supposed to handle what and what do I do when a situation like that is described in the letter of these calls are coming in and I have no authority to do anything about them and the only people that I'm being told do have that authority are sending the calls back to me. And then you wind up with people who've been bitten by dogs and animals that are dying and nobody's doing anything about it. I, mean, I don't. I don't think that's the town's wants to sit on that either. So um, I think that we do have a need to get familiar with uh, on the board level with what the statute says, and that we're going to be limited by what the statute allows the town to do in terms of animal regulation, especially by the agricultural exemption, which you and I have discussed a little bit. Right. Um, and I'll be, I'll be interested in what you, you had mentioned that Garrett talked some more about that with you today. Yes. Um, and, you know, ways that other animals than dogs and cats and ferrets can be included. So I'll be interested in, in what he and the league have to say about that. And I think that would be good information to have as we start. I think the board on another track, the board, you know, really wants to um, support you in getting the education that you need um, to do the enforcement aspect of it. And as far as I've understood from you, that's kind of just a matter of there isn't training available spaces yeah. right now. So, I mean, from, from what I'm, I'm seeing and I'm learning is that there, the task force that we keep being referred to, I don't think is even together right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think on a, on a higher level, <clears throat> for, for the state of Vermont is shifting. Like, I, th I think Kimball Road actually made people remember that there's an issue that needs to be addressed on the state level. So I haven't had time to sit down and, and read the emails, but I skimmed over it. Um, and I know that they're trying to get some of those task force or one of those organizations back up and running. Um, so uh, what the immediate need that we have is I, as the animal control officer for the town of Brandon, can only follow what is in the said ordinance because that is what the town of Brandon has adopted as their animal control ordinance. So I am not allowed to enforce anything outside or deal with anything outside of our town's ordinance until the town ordinance changes and I have the proper training for however it, it changes. 
Right. So I'm sure that the town adopted the ordinance in light of what it was allowed to do by statute and statute may have changed in the intervening time for sure, 25 years, whatever it is. So I think probably Tim is on the right track where I think we ought to have like a little subgroup working with you, either a selectman or a town manager or one or both kind of thing, and you and probably Chief Brickell, if he's able to support the endeavor, um, to take a look at Brandon's ordinance, take a look at the league's model ordinance, take a look at the statute. I'm sure the league's model ordinance is really well informed by the statute um, and go from there, I think, as a building block. So- um, Did the attachments come through in my email? Yes, thank okay. you. I, or for me, at least, it did. There's a PDF of the Big Book of Wolf, the entire right. book. Right, right. So, um, what, what's the pleasure of the board on that? Does that sound like a worthwhile course? Yes. I'm getting some thumbs up. Any volunteers? Animal control, I have to say, is something I know nothing about. <laughs> Um, I'd be willing to help out um, in looking into this. Um, I'd prefer not to do it alone. <laughs> I have I have literally spent days <laughs> pouring over all of the state statutes. Like, grab my number, we'll talk. <laughs> I'll point you in the right direction. So that's a good start. And Chief Raquel, I didn't mean to put you on the spot without talking to you <laughs> beforehand, but is that something you can help to educate whoever it is, us on the board, uh, and Margaret? Uh, I can certainly do that as soon as I'm, I'm clear on what the select board is looking for. Um, I haven't seen a copy of Margaret's report, so I don't know what's in that or what it entails. So certainly with, uh, with some direction from the board, I can certainly help out. So what is the direction of the board? Is the direction of the board to redraft Brandon's law, uh, animal enforcement ordinance uh, what to make it more to make it as expansive as statute allows is that a good way to put it I, I, I have to say from the limited amount of knowledge that I do have on this topic I think we're going to be surprised at how little statute allows I, I really do I think that we're going to be allowed to regulate dogs cats and ferrets and I think that it will surprise me if the league has found some other way for especially livestocky kinds of animals to be regulated by a local ordinance. Um, it's, it's in there. I wish that I had the right. email now, but Garrett and I talked about it and yeah. there is, I mean, because they know that there are animals that are owned that are not part of farming, mm -hmm. but th there right. is. So Tim and Margaret to start and then uh, you can, or Tim, you want me to join you? Um, it might be helpful to have two of us on there. Right. How about that? We'll start with Tim and Margaret and me, and then uh, the other guys can heckle whatever work product we come up with like they usually do. Okay. Is that good, Margaret? Anything else? Um, it, this question would be for Chief. Is, has anybody on the department taken the animal welfare training course? Yes. Awesome. Because there was the league, there was a uh, back and forth about who is the main agent, and they they kept referring it back to the select board and the health officer, and the health officer hasn't had the training yet either, so he doesn't know. So, I I personally think that it would be very useful if if you and I could work together. We're trying to figure out like whose whose job is what. Very good. Okay. Anything else on that front? Any questions for the animal control officer? Okay. So where's this, uh, Margaret, we appreciate you um, rejuvenating a, a town department that really has been juggled around to a few different responsible parties. And we appreciate the previous parties for the work that they did um, and, uh, and the energy that you're bringing to, to the department now into the effort. 
Okay, so item five is public comment. So this is items not on the agenda. We generally start with the board. Mr. Wyman, anything not on the agenda you want to talk about? Nothing. Mr. Giles? No. Mr. Coolidge? Nothing. I have nothing. So the public is welcome to participate with, yeah, hands up. Thanks, Mr. Moore, to start. Star six to unmute, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, uh, um, uh, D David and I talked about it, and I just let him know, and it got put on Facebook. We, uh, fortunately, we, we had to cancel the uh, the carnival for this year. Um, mm. It was uh, a tough decision. Uh, we spoke with Mr. Miller of uh, Miller Amusements, who's the amusement company, um, and they don't foresee them being able to do anything in Vermont without having access to the, uh, the workers typically that, uh, that they bring in from uh, outside of the country to help, as well as all these other places canceling. We would have been their first event by moving it to July 18th, um, and they don't, they don't anticipate being able to open it off because of the lack of workers and the fears around reactor so it gives us more time to plan for next year so if anybody's interested in being involved in the planning or, or want to help out um we're going to try to do something this fall if we can uh between the brand area toy project and brandon wreck and other people try to do something that will be safe uh, and a way to have people to get together before the winter comes hopefully if we can in a safe manner that's big news thank you mr moore other public comment items not on the agenda Public participation. Can I say, a, oh. Representative Jerome. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to just give a little update on, on what's happening in the house and um, my activities. So I, I've been asked to um, lead a group of legislators. There's 25 legislators, including Butch, who are working on um, unemployment and um, pandemic unemployment assistance issues, as you know, I'm um, sure that so many people have applied for unemployment insurance and there, because of the huge numbers that have, have applied, there's been a, a incredible number of people who are having a lot of difficulty in getting their benefits. So uh, the legis the, the, excuse me, the legislators have received over 2000 um, Constituents have sent in issues for them of where they're not getting not getting their payments. Some have not received their benefits for eight weeks or so, and it's really getting to be quite a dire situation. So we made great progress this past week and have cut our the constituent issues down in half. So we're looking at about 1,000 people that we're, we still need to help. And I feel really good about being able to help so many people around the state as well as in our three towns um, with, their, with their unemployment problems. And I um, just want to also just keep you up to date, let you know that if you need additional information or if you want information about um, bills that are going through and all the bills that we're working on right now are all COVID-19 issues. So just let me know and I'm happy to send you an update um, or put you in touch with a person who may be the expert, uh, the subject expert on that, on that particular bill too. And then just to wrap it up, I just want to tell you that I was on a really terrific uh, phone call or a Zoom call today with 300 participants and it was organized by the Vermont Arts Council and it was the purpose of that was to talk about the arts and um, how the creative sector is going to manage uh, the year to get through the COVID-19 and on to um, post COVID-19. So it's very interesting and um, it was great to have the opportunity to speak to that, that number of people and recognize the importance for the um, creative economy in Vermont. That's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Representative Jerome or for Representative Shaw? They're both here tonight. Any questions for them or further public comment? I have a, a, a quick comment, Seth. Yeah, thanks. If I may switch. Uh, along with the cancellations that uh, unfortunately Bill just announced, uh, the town of Pittsford has canceled their Pittsford Day celebration, which usually happens around the 17th of August. Uh, and I know a lot of folks from, from, from your area come down and enjoy the festivities. So we're, they were uh, quite disappointed that they had to cancel that event. Uh, so, and then, and I know you're uh, going to talk about at a later, uh, S.334, uh, a little later at, at uh, Mr. Giles asked about, and at that time, maybe we should talk about H948's bill that's uh, going through uh, 
through the house, likely to pass out of the house uh, on, on Wednesday. So I'd like to speak to that uh, when, when you get there. Sure, it's the next item, I think. Uh, so okay. we'll, we'll take a little bit more public comment or participation first, if there is any. Barry, did you have anything tonight for us? Just really quick, Seth. Um, yeah. Things are going great on the school front. Um, probably the most immediate topic at hand is what the end of year celebrations are going to look like with graduation and whatnot. Um, this past Friday, the Secretary of Education announced that all, all ceremonies would have to adhere to the 10 person per gathering, um, which really limits options tremendously. Um, Gene is doing, Gene Collins right now is doing a sensing session with parents and kids to see what ideas may come up for a, a different form of a celebration. Obviously, it's not going to be traditional. So Thank we'll see. That that that's, that's, that's a tough thing to think about the graduations, but yeah, good information to finally have. And any others before we go on? Well, I have a question. Brett Bueller here. Brett Bueller. The, the discussions coming up next about the legislature, do we, any of those have to do with the uh, property taxes? Yes. The relief? Yes. In fact, yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So if that's, if that's good for public participation, we'll go on to that. Um, so we do have... Um, we do have S-344, which is a bill that Representative Jerome forwarded along to us uh, this afternoon or evening. And uh, it's not yet been signed by the governor, so it's not yet law. Um, but it does talk about the municipal property tax and temporary provisions authorizing a deadline extension, a waiver of penalties and fees, and adjustment of the municipal tax rate. And I would say it's a very important to note the last little bit of it, which is that it applies only to the town tax, not to the school tax. If I'm correct, am I correct in reading that? Getting a nod from Butch? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I guess the way I read it, Seth, was looking at like, because if you read up, oh, I'm looking right at it here. So, uh, number two says establish a grace period for decrease or waive any penalty interest or fee imposed on taxpayers for the late payment of a municipal property tax or statewide education property tax collected by the municipality. So that means we can waive or you guys could waive interest and penalty collecting it. But this last section says that the town is still liable for paying it and we are not subject to any interest or penalty waivers there that we would have to pay it if we paid late. All right, so um, you raise a good point. So we can waive the penalty on the amount that includes the school tax. It's that we cannot reduce the property tax rate for the amount that includes the school tax. Maybe that's the more accurate reading of it. So um, I did, who was I talking to? I don't even remember, but they said, um, we're not a town that pays to, Brandon is not, so it's not true for all the towns in OV, but Brandon is not a town that pays statewide property tax to the state. We are a town that pays it only to our school district. Does that sound right? So I think that they're, um, what you're talking about is the penalty for not paying the education portion of the property tax on time. And what um, discussion I was part of was um, that we don't have a state penalty looking at us. Oh, maybe it was Sue Gage. That's who it was. We don't have a, we're not looking at a state penalty because we don't pay to the state any of our education property tax. We pay it entirely to the school district and then the school district gets additional money from the state educational property tax. So if there was a penalty, uh, it would come to us from the school district and Sue had not, she had asked the school district, but she had not got an answer from them when she and I talked as to whether they would hold the town to paying on time or not. 
So thoughts on the board about this? It's interesting to um, read some other aspects of that um, because in addition to waiving penalties and fees, um, there's a possibility of reducing um, taxes if in fact there's savings from um, COVID-19 um, events. Um, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that there is, but I just think that it's, it's a, um, it's a broad discussion of, of what can happen if this goes through. And I, I, that's why I wanted to start it today to get us thinking about it so we would have time to reflect and, and get input from people. It is good to have time to reflect. And I hope that um, you got an email. I hope the board got an email that I sent that was a forward from Sue Gage where she did a little bit of a prediction or estimate as to how much Brandon was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, th I found that very useful. Um, you know, she suspected something on the order of, you know, plus or minus $20,000 is what we're talking about. And, you know, less than 20 taxpayers, she suspected would be really kind of at the end of their tether and not able to make the last payment. So that's, I don't, I think that, you know, if we, if we take no action at all, then those folks can just go to the board of abatement. And the Board of Abatement can choose to abate interest and penalties, as it always has, um, and or taxes. Or the Board of Select, the Select Board could, if it chose to do like a preemptive waiver of those interests and penalties. And that's, that's kind of the decision to make, assuming it gets signed by the governor. Hmm. So is, is there other contribution on this? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, Butch was wave, waving his hand to speak. Yeah, I, go Butch. Thanks. Uh, this was a, uh, a topic of discussion when the bill passed. Uh, and it, the bill is intended in, in uh, Section A, parentheses A, uh, to be uh, a deli. You can choose one, two, or three. Uh, not all are interconnected. Even though it, it reads, it read, does read a little squirrely and it's got an and in it. Uh, it's intended to be a, just a second, I gotta get rid of that phone. Yeah. <laughs> Our Zoom call's interesting. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so those, those three, are, they're, they're not all together. They're an either or, or. Uh, and, but the, the one thing, uh, and, and, and David and I have had uh, several conversations about will the town have to pay their share of the education property tax? And that's an un un unequivocal yes. Uh, there's no, going to be no relief on paying, the, as of today, there's no relief on paying the ed, ed property tax. You have to pay that. It's up to you folks whether you want to uh, uh, waive uh, any late penalties or interest or fees or whatever that you may incur or you may incur to the taxpayers. So that's, that's up in, 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 uh, in print A, in, under Sex 1 print A. So you, you have that authority. But beyond that, everything else, as, as the chair rightfully said, is uh, all deals with municipal taxes. And here again, it allows you that authority to do that. Uh, I understand uh, that there will be a, uh, never mind, wrong bill. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's what's happening with that, but it's a deli section and, uh, and in, 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 in print C, it clearly states that this shall apply only to property taxes. And, uh, so you're, you're, you're still on the hook. And I know Dave has asked me a lot about it. And I know he's asked our representative Jerome about it several times. You're still on the hook for your ed property tax, whomever you pay it to, you're still on the hook for that. So the good clarification, whoever we pay it to. Yeah. My big concern with that is, and I've, I have spoke with most of the guys about this too, that, you know, if we have to borrow to pay education tax, we're going to be subject to interest ourselves just to, you know, make sure the school. So that's going to hurt us financially in order to just get the education folks their money. I, I don't think that's, that's the part that's bothering me. You know, everyone's so, got phones out here, but now we're all subject to interest after the fact. So, so I understand that, Dave, and and I think I forwarded you uh, some conversations that Ways and Means were having. Yep. Uh, the Ways and Means is the taxation committee, and they are uh, considering uh, uh, either con considering refunding the towns 
uh, for the interest that they may or may not have to uh, spend to borrow the money to pay the red fund tax. Uh, I don't know where it is right now, but it was under consideration as of uh, early last week. Uh, the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. I got I to gotta tell you. Uh, we're looking at some huge budget deficits in both budgets, the 20 and 21 budget. So uh, we're looking at property taxes, state education property taxes that will knock your socks off. Yeah, I've heard that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think for the immediate term, um, you know, it's worth thinking about, but I, I really was, my, my fears were allayed by talking with Sue when she said, you know, we're talking about $20,000, but maybe talking about $30,000. Like she, and Dave also said, like, he's, uh, he's pretty confident that most folks either have paid or are going to be able to pay their property taxes this year. So this, this may be something that, you know, affects a very small number of taxpayers and affects the town in a very small way. We, we pay about a million dollars a quarter to the school district. And I don't think we're in any danger that we're not going to have a million dollars on hand when the bill is due to pay the school district. So this is a little bit of a, theoretical kind of discussion. Um, when the governor signs it, it will become a little bit more real. But I don't feel, um, I don't feel like this is some kind of urgent thing and it's going to affect a huge number of taxpayers. And if we don't do it, the town's going to be short on paying the school tax. The town's going to be able to pay the school tax is the bottom line. We'll know what better in four days, you know, what we're right. Yeah. Our, our last payment is due this Friday, right? Yeah. And, you know, one of my things was what, you know, what I've been asking Sue, like, what's our percentage of folks whose taxes are escrowed? You know, there is quite a bit of income sensitivity in this town, too. So that's why I don't know if we're going to know where we stand until towards the end of the month when we've got, you know, the rest of the folks coming in and paying their taxes. So. Yeah. And any public comment on this? I know that there was some interest in it at the last meeting, and I just saw Brent unmute. Well, I, I guess I would have to ask, does the town not have a reserve fund? I mean, when Newton well, Road we, got we do, washed out. And we do, and I don't think we're going to need to use it is the point. I think we have it on hand. If we're talking about people needing aid, though, to the tune of $30,000, why make them jump through the abatement process and all of that? Why not give them the assistance they need? Knowing they're going to pay it back, it's, it's just temporary. It's also... The reserve fund is really a taxpayer savings account. So you use savings during emergencies like you did on Newton Road. Well, one of the things that this isn't necessarily just a, they're going to pay it back. It's temporary. Some of this is waiving fees. So the board has to consider whether we're going to waive fees. Right. I, I, I might suggest that this is an exceptional time. Um, as we all know, um, you know, this pandemic is, um, is changing a lot of things at a lot of levels. And it's impressive to see, um, you know, some of the big banks are, are, are waiving um, uh, issues around loan payment repayments because they know um, people are, are really up against the wall. And so I just think it makes sense for us to have this conversation, to try to share the load the way we do in, in other ways with this pandemic. And um, once we know if the governor signs it, um, it, it would be appropriate for us to talk about this again with that in mind. Yeah, I think it is good to have the conversation and an additional public input is welcome at this time or between now and the next meeting when we would expect that it might be enacted so that the board could consider actually doing something and not just talking. Right. Well, isn't the town, if I understand you, the town's able to make its obligation that's my understanding from the town treasurer is that the okay. number of taxpayers will be small and the amount of money that will become delinquent will be small. Okay. So these folks back is already up against the wall. Um, you know, and now they're looking at an 8% penalty possibly and this and that. Um, can't you in the meantime, at least give them a little sense of, relief they have mortgage payments they have other things to worry about as well yeah, so. until governor scott signs the um the bill 
we're, we're a little bit, you know, cart before the horse on, on talking about it tonight. It's just kind of a get a sense of the board. It was to get information to the board, get some public input, uh, get some information confirmed or corrected by our state representatives okay. who are both here. I think this is a good exploratory educational kind of time, but I don't think that the board needs to commit to any course of action tonight. But if I'm hearing you correctly, it really doesn't matter if the governor signs this or not. We're going to meet our obligation. <clears throat> yes. And the obligation now is actually to the unemployed folks in the town. Right. And it's, we don't know, as, as of this Friday afternoon, we don't know that there will be anybody who is in a position where they need the town to assist okay. them this way. I there understand. May be none, there okay. may be a number. And, and Brent, I think perhaps the piece that you don't realize that I've come to understand more clearly is that the select board can't just waive fees and um, penalties. That's actually something that gets voted on, you know, by mm -hmm. the taxpayers. And so unless the governor signs this bill, we don't have the authority to do that. Okay. I, I, am I correct? Yes, Seth? That's my understanding. Yeah. That's, why, that's why you have the BCA. I mean, they can... You know, there's the criteria they can follow, and hardship is one of them. So, um, and they're already in place. I, I was under the impression if the state got their money, that was satisfied that requirement, and the rest was the town's issue. Um, do we know if the abatement is still occurring, or when it's occurring? Abatement occurs on a demand basis from a taxpayer who requests an abatement hearing. Okay. I, isn't there a, a certain application deadline? And No, there is not, in fact. Oh, okay. But, but, you know, it would be helpful, and I'm glad you brought it up, Dave, just briefly about the ba abatement, because I've been thinking about the pros and cons of that, um, having sat on the board of um, abatement. And my concern is that um, for, for people to get relief on the board of abatement, it can't just be hardship. They have to literally not have the money. And um, I think that's where it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a less good vehicle for um, relieving people of penalties and fees than if the governor signs this and we go that route. Um, as long as they meet one of the seven criteria in their, um, their t conversation with the BCA, they're, they're sh it's, you know, it's up to the board on how they vote on it, but if they follow under criteria for hardship, I have seen it. The board has done it before, so um, it could happen that way. I mean, I can't predict how any of that works, but that is already set in place in our town for these types of issues. Whether it's from COVID-19 or just someone falling on hard times. Well, the direction I've gotten when I've sat on the board is that this, those seven criteria are actually very specific and, um, um, hard to meet. But I, I believe financial hardship is one of them. It, as I read it, it's not hardship. You have to not have the money. You have to show that you literally they don't. Might not. They might not have the money. Well, right. But I mean, it, okay, yeah, in, in that extreme case, you're right. And I guess I, I, I think we're looking about trying to keep people from reaching that level of extreme hardship. Well, I guess the thing I'm trying to say is if something doesn't get signed sooner or later or whatever, we have something in place where I folks agree. can go and state their case. I agree, Dave. Thanks. That's sure. Good point. Yeah, Bernie Cock? I think Dave said he felt like we may not be in too bad a shape of people being able to pay their taxes. I think that could be a fairly small number too, and I think it might very well be those same people that just went through three years of construction and significant business depredation over that course of that time. So you might find that it's just some of those businesses that said, we're ready to come out of this mess of construction and start making some money in a normal way. And the pandemic came in and took that away. So I agree. I, I think that could be a fairly small number. And if the governor's um, proposal goes through, and he signs it, the, the bill, those might be who you see coming to you saying, once we get back in some income stream, we can take care of this, but we need a little break right now. And that can be a, really valuable and to know that the, it's also in place. If that doesn't go through, through the abatement process, that's good too. Um, this, this could not have come at a 
more difficult time mm -hmm. for this, the segments of businesses, especially. Um, so we, we appreciate all the efforts that have gone in from both the governor's side and you know that it's the company mill that's in place too from the town side. Thanks, Bernie. That, that is a good point. Um, and the board traditionally has not had applications from business owners on commercial property, mostly because business owners know that to be unable to pay property taxes means the board needs to see all of your income and loss and you have to demonstrate that you don't have enough money to pay your property taxes, not that you've prioritized other bills before your property taxes. So that, that is a, it's an interesting point, good point. Was there comment about um, this other bill? Did you say H948 uh, from Representative Jerome or Representative Shaw? I don't see Butch right now. There he is. Back. He ran to get a pen or something. No, I went to get a piece of licorice. Okay. <laughs> Even more important. So is it yeah. H948? Is that what you said, Butch? Nine, yes, 948, Seth. I just forwarded to David. And uh, it it's, hasn't passed the House yet, but I want to give you a little heads up on it. It's likely to pass the House and pass the Senate and be signed by the governor. Uh, what, it, what this bill will do, it will adapt, allow your quasi-judicial uh, uh, committees uh, in, in your town to meet electronically, i.e. the BCA and your Zoning Board of Adjustment would have quasi-judicial judicial authority, currently do not have the authority to meet uh, remotely. So this would give those two boards a, uh, the authority to do that and not even designate where they're, where they're going to hold the meeting through electronic means. In other words, they won't have to do like Dave's doing today and sitting uh, tonight and sitting in the town office because that's the local spot. So the whole entire board can meet like the House of Representatives meeting. We don't need to be in the House. We, we can all meet uh, together on an electronic platform. So that will allow that to those type of boards, which is important because you have uh, your, your uh, uh, appeals period coming up for your valuation on your property in June, and then the appeals will be going to uh, uh, your Board of Civil Authorities likely in, in late, uh, late uh, mid to late July. And I, I don't know that we'll be out of the restrictions we're in now by that time, so that's important. But the other important piece uh, for the BCA and this, this is going to hold in the bill, is that it will relieve the BCA. Uh, they'll be able to take the option of not visiting properties uh, to inspect them. And, and those of you in here that are on the BCA understand the value of that. You can either decide to or not to visit. And that's, that's created a bit of a rub. It created a bit of a rub for me uh, because I think a physical inspection of the property is extremely important for the protection of both the uh, the, uh, the the taxpayer and and the town, but it but will give your board that particular uh, option to either go out and inspect or not go out and inspect, depending on the situation. So this bill is, is it's a house bill. It's headed for the Senate probably Wednesday af afternoon, and I'm sure it'll pass the Senate very quickly and head for the governor after it gets through all the proper channels. But just a heads up to those to the people that are on those two boards that if you need to meet right now, you do not have the authority to meet electronically. So you should wait until this uh, this bill passes if you're going to meet electronically. That's my that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. That's, that's uh, good news, and that's uh, it's actually new information because I think we have a BCA <laughs> meeting warned for Wednesday night by Zoom, and maybe uh, we're not authorized to do that yet. I, don't I do not believe I I don't believe you're authorized right now to do that. So uh, we might want to. I'll touch base with uh, our town clerk tomorrow because she's the yeah. convener of that board. Yeah. And we have the chair of that of, board in this meeting. So he's, yeah. he's got the info now too. We, we have specifically allowed folks like you to meet electronically. And I, Stephanie, you can jump in here at any moment, rescue me. Uh, but we've specifically allowed your board and other boards to meet uh, via uh, COVID-19 legislation. And uh, we apparently did not catch up with BCA and the ZBAs. So this, this would uh, relieve that, that responsibility. Quizzical look from the town manager? No? 
No, I'm reading and listening at the same reading time. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that update. Uh, if we could, can we move on to item six appointments? Is there any objection to taking the appointments as a consent and doing it all at once? No objection from the board. All in favor of item six appointments as submitted, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That's unanimous. Item seven, there's two warrants. I'll make a motion to approve the first warrant of May 11th, amount of $55,575.75. Okay. Coolidge, second by Mr. Wyman. Any discussion on the first warrant? If not, ready to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That's unanimous. Second warrant is Route 7. I'll make a motion on that one, too, in the amount of $782.78. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Wyman to Mr. Coolidge's motion. Any discussion? Not any. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, so we don't have item eight, which is executive <coughs> motion. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Giles. Those are not debatable. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The ayes have it. Okay, so now we'll convene the Board of Liquor as the Board of Liquor Con 756. I call the Liquor Control Commissioners to order. Is there a motion on the agenda? Yeah, so Mr. Wyman moves adoption. Second. Second from Mr. Coolidge. Any changes to be made? There aren't any. All in favor of the agenda as presented, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. The ayes have it. That's unanimous. Uh, any objection to taking item two and three as a consent agenda? No. No, no. no objection. If, if none heard, uh, is there a motion to take number two and number three as a consent agenda? I'll make that motion. Ms. Coolidge moves to approve. Second. Second from Mr. Giles. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed. That's unanimous. Item four, Mr. Coolidge. Motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. Mr. Wyman, all in favor, say aye. 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 Liquor control commissioners are adjourned. Order. Is there a motion on the agenda? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. second. There's a second. Any discussion? Anything need to be changed on the agenda? This is to have a joint meeting with the Prudential Board of Brandon Fire District Number One. We thank them for their attendance. Sorry that we're just getting to this at eight o'clock. If no uh, other discussion, all in favor of adopting the agenda as is presented, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? No. The ayes have it. Item two, approve the minutes of February 10th, 2020. So moved. Mr. Wyman moves to approve. I'll second that. Mr. Coolidge seconds. Any errors or omissions in those minutes? If not, all in favor of approval of the minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. The ayes have it. Item three. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the Prudential Board. We have. Uh, Mike Markowski, thank you. We have Del Cook, thank you. We have Peter Smith, yep, yeah, thank you. And we have Ray Counter, the water superintendent, all present with us. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, item three is to have a meeting with the Prudential Board. Um, is there a first motion to move into an executive session? I'll make a motion to move into executive session and to include the Prudential Board and the Town Manager. Is there a second? Yes. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the executive session motion? So I'm trying to understand um, how this would um, find 
the premature general public knowledge of a contract would place the town at a substantial disadvantage. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me that this is um, this information is something that needs to be in executive session. Is there comment on that? Well, there will be certain topics discussed that could place the town and the fire district at a disadvantage if they're discussed in an open meeting town. I think we're going to cover a few items here that are pretty sensitive. They have already been discussed about possible litigation. I guess I wasn't aware that there was possible litigation. You're, you're about to find out if we're going to executive session. Do we want to uh, consider the other executive session then? Is this the wrong one or is this an okay one? I mean, we're still talking about a contract with the fire district. Mm -hmm. I mean, the end, the end effect would be the same, I guess, whether we are in <laughs> under contracts or whether we go in under um, litigation, pending litigation, potential litigation. It, it just feels like some of this information is um, is information that you know the public ought to be interested in and and know something about. And I guess I'm I'm wondering if there's some way we can share some information and keep some information that we need to keep private. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, Dave, to do it that way? Well, my suggestion would be that if that is the case, that someone when we come out of executive session. Someone from the board could make motion a motion to make a statement. Make a, yeah. a statement. I'm happy with that result. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and a second to find the premature general well, public knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a comment? One too. That we we'll have to go off uh, Zoom once we go into executive session too. Yeah, but we haven't voted on it yet. So we have a motion and a second to find the premature general public knowledge of the pending contract with Brandon Fire District Number One will clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. Is there further discussion? If not, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so that's unanimous. Is there now the second motion? So moved. Mr. Wyman moves. Is there a second? Yes. Mr. Coolidge seconds to enter into executive session to discuss the town's pending contract with Brandon Fire District Number One under the provisions of Title One, Section 313A1 of the Vermont Statutes. And this would include the Prudential Board and uh, Superintendent of the Water Department. Town Manager also, correct? And the Town Manager, yeah. Clear on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. So that's unanimous as well. Okay, so we'll enter into an executive session at 8.03. <laughs>